Okay, fabulous. And I'm, my name is Denise Easton, and I am the acting president and catalyst and on the board for Plexus Institute, but it's really um, an, a volunteer organization that is informed by a number of people who have been actively involved in the past and are now actively involved in starting new projects, sharing conversations, and more importantly, connecting to other people in the network to use complexity thinking to sort of address some of our most challenging, challenging problems. So I'm going to turn this over to Mike Taylor before we start our full conversation. So he can sort of set it up um, on what the Commons project is, where we are, and why we're having this series of conversations in January. And I have a feeling there'll be a number of others that are going to be um, circled in the next four to six weeks. But what I will ask you is if you are not currently muted, please take an opportunity to mute your microphone and then feel free at any point to um, jump in with a question or a comment because that's why these are very informal and they are open conversations and dialogues. But um, until then, we'll just keep it muted so that we can sort of monitor the background okay. of the folks. Okay, thank you. Mike, would you like to jump in? Uh, thank you very oh, much. Okay. Um, I also <clears throat> want to introduce um, Karen um, Stars, sorry, um, Stashauer, um, who is uh, giving the thumbs up there. Um, she's also um, going to be uh, contributing to this um, talk today. And uh, we wanted this to be uh, an open conversation because we were uh, seeing that many different projects were having somewhat of the same kinds of problems. So the project particularly, that we're working on in Plexus Institute is called the Commons Project, where we're creating a social media platform that will feed back um, information to people about their uh, environmental impact, uh, their day-to-day -day actions. It will also create a what's called a stable coin, uh, not a Bitcoin, but a different kind of coin that's grounded in valuing common use resources such as land, water, and air. And the distribution of this coin is, um, is going to be administered through the blockchain on what's called a smart contract. So the goal of the project is to assist people to find ways in which they can lessen their environmental impact and at the same time provide them with a coin of value. Now, as we start to go through this, and this is where other projects uh, that people are working on or, or concerns that people are, are having might come forward. And as we start to work on this, uh, this project, um, we're getting a lot of positive feedback, but the thing that concerns some of us, oh my God, what if we were actually successful? <laughs> what if we became very large and very big? And the reason why this is a problem is because when you have a, a if you start small, as happens often in uh, complex adaptive systems, and become large, you can have a large impact. And uh, how you design a project from the beginning will have an impact on how its, um, um, what its impact will be uh, in the future and how it evolves uh, as we know all about initial steps and how initial steps create the path that you will then follow. The other thing that we wanted to do, and um, this is something that I've, I've talked about with Karen uh, quite a bit uh, and others, is that in this social media platform, we wanted to avoid the problems that um, other social media platforms have had in terms of recreating existing social in inequities, such as uh, income equity, um, in inequities, um, racial, gender, um, those kinds of things. So we knew that many social media platforms, whether it be something as generally useful as Wikipedia to something like Facebook now is very well known for its, its issues. We didn't want to um, re recreate some of the same problems in there, but we knew there was gonna be a potential because as we work into this um, highly evolved tech field, it's very difficult to find uh, women and uh, people of color for those particular historical societal reasons. It's hard to find participants. So we decided to have this pop-up 
and use this Commons project um, sort of as a, um, a live learning lab and get ideas from across, <laughs> from across the globe, essentially, on how um, on concepts people might have, because you never know what you're going to find when you do one of these things, um, concepts people might have in terms of how to avoid recreating social inequities in a new social media platform and how to anticipate um, problems that your new platform might create. Um, and just to start off the conversation, one of the things that, uh, that we realized is that um, because this was uh, a coin, this particular stable coin that was based in the environment is something that anyone in the world could earn, it could become, uh, it could almost become like a default currency because it could be earned by anyone in Vietnam or India or other places simply with a smartphone and could be accumulated um, based upon their uh, impact on the environment. There's another uh, number of other possible implications with this project that we have to work through to make sure that as we're trying to create something that's good, we don't unintentionally create something that's bad or just continue something that is not helpful socially. So um, Karen, do you want to add anything at this point or do you want to come in later? You need to unmute, unmute yourself. Here I am. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think there are um, two two ways to kind of think of. First of all, I, I joined this conversation really as a traveler and a very current learner in the equity and inclusion space. Um, and um, part of the reason I think that that Mike asked me to sit in and potentially help facilitate or comment is um, I am very engaged with my own graduate university and a number of the other efforts to look at how we um, create and unknowingly recreate um, social uh, bias and equity related challenges that are structural within the organizations that we work with. What I think is interesting here is we're talking about that learning applied to a potentially virtual and highly decentralized um, uh, effort. So th th I think there is some work on that. Um, but uh, what I, what I, so what I want to say just as we start is one, I think that we can talk about how we avoid that or what we can learn from past mistakes. I think even more important is figuring out how we it as we go along. So our intention will help and we can think about how we establish gates to entry. Um, I, I know if it gets really big we're talking about something maybe related to pay, who has influence, who doesn't, um, all, all of those questions um, about how we kind of set things up. But, but probably even more importantly, is how do we create conversations where we continue to talk about that and uncover it? So I think it is very difficult, if not, uh, if not impossible. I, I sort of treat myself with suspicion now that what I think about organizations, the way I approach the work that I do, have a, um, have a white bias. I've been socialized that way. I see things that way. Um, I think those things are, um, they're more comfortable and more right. And I, I don't say that with any um, ne negative feelings about it. I just think that it's about humility and the ability to say, hmm, are we putting this in play even if we don't quite know it? And looking for ways to listen to voices and include voices that are different from our own. Um, and then really inquire about the ongoing experience if that makes any sense like those are the practices we have to figure out how to get into place because we won't do it right we just you cannot do it right so to put Does that a help like yeah totally then so to support that point and put a concrete example into it wikipedia which i use quite a bit and it <laughs> contributed to uh financially not so much article wise but anyway the um it has, a, it has a bias, a tendency to value um, 
male contributions and female contributions would be more important because they don't create Wikipedia pages for every person. Um, um, but they do have a tendency to more quickly recognize uh, male contribution because 86% of the reviewers who decide what pages are, are, are significant or not significant are male. And that has, even so it was not intentional. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They didn't say, let's create a barrier to women being recognized on the media. Right. It ended up being that way. That's right. And we don't do it intentionally. Mm -hmm. But what I'm really um, clear, what I'm crystal clear about, if we're really serious about that part of the work, is that it's an ongoing stance towards inquiry to people who may have a difference of opinion. We won't see it. Um, you know, other people will see or experience it. So how do we put that kind of inquiry into our practice and our structures and some of the rest of it? Um, I, I, it does seem to me, and this is not like, it just seems to me, I love the complexity world. I feel like so much I don't know, and it does look very white. I don't really understand that. Um, but I, so I think it's something for us to, to to know to have to have an inquiry mindset about that's what i would say about that and i do think there's a link to that with learning and collective learning um which was the other thing um that that i was going to mention is more of a question around in a way we're, we're creating something and, and i'm still understanding really what 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 this is although i'm incredibly drawn to it but it it's like if we're understanding our environmental impact personally or within a business that we're associated with that's kind of one level of learning but how do we create that that learning within the platform itself is there an opportunity for generative learning that's even broader than me using this in some way on my own generating coin using coin or or at least understanding my own footprint and how do we um, build, is there are there mechanisms that we could play with that would help build that in from the start? So those are the lenses that I'm bringing, and I think why why Mike asked me to um, sit in and help tee up the call in some way. So we have Mike? a comment from Naomi, which I think is is wonderful. Uh, isn't it odd we're asking each other how we should yeah. be inclusive, but not the people we're trying to include? Um, exactly. And one of the things we did, Naomi, was we, I personally reached out to a number of organizations that tried to change the, the mix of uh, persons within various industries, including tech industries, and um, have not gotten um, response other than, thank you for contacting us, we're very busy, kind of response. So, Naomi, if you'd like to make a comment, feel free to do uh, additional comments. Feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Uh, Naomi, I just want to say I think that's a great comment. And um, we're talking about being inclusive, but and I don't know that this is the forum. We also, I don't know that we know yet enough to know even ourselves how we may experience inclusivity differently um, based on differences that may or may not be visible with us. I mean, so I think that is, a, it's a great, it's a great comment. Okay, so sorry, I wasn't, I had, I had not unmuted and then I lost the... Oh, great. <laughs> so this is Naomi. Um, so, in, in, your, in, in reaching out to people you wanted to include and you then didn't get a response to them, from them rather, does that mean that your or our method of reaching out is itself a barrier? Are there other methods of reaching out that would generate a response? Absolutely. I can't help feeling that we're, that we're stuck, get sort of, earnest about something that we feel strongly about which is great and then don't actually have the tools to to think differently about it ourselves i think it's related to something like uh, what michael had brought up earlier and that's some um it's um 
an, an institutional slowness or um, an institutional protectiveness. Um, so the reason why Michael may be, one of the reasons why Michael may be having difficulty in his school system getting change is that institutional protection. And um, what my personal opinion is, is that institutions tend to be self-protective and um, they have an interest in working with you if you are at least their size or maybe a little bit bigger or you also have money for them. Uh, they'll be interested, but um, they probably do get a number of inquiries. They just don't have a methodology to work through these inquiries unless it's a, uh, unless it's a um, size peer, um, is, is my opinion, Naomi. Um, so there's lots of different ways to re reach out in um, social media. I even reached out, I, I was able to talk to someone on Southwest Flight about the Dream Corps. Um, who is it? Um, uh, I forget the name of the guy, uh, Van Jones in Dream Corps, because he does a lot of stuff in this area with coding. And so I had a personal contact and it didn't go anywhere either. So I, I think there's some institutional um, slowness that can, that can uh, keep uh, new, new ideas from coming in. Mm -hmm. That's my particular take. I'm going to jump in here too, and it's nice to see you here, Naomi. Um, I also think that it has to do with, um, to some extent, where we are in the design process of this, because there are different conversations happening on social media. Uh, I, I and Plexus use uh, Twitter a great deal, and interestingly enough, there's some really vibrant conversations and people who use that to share, but are not jumping into what I will call sort of this higher engagement level at this point. And maybe it's because we're in the framing of the project versus here's an actual call for people to respond to or participate to something. Now, as Mike stated, we were, were hoping, and I think this is a good example, there's several people on this call today who have never participated or I'm not familiar with from the Plexus Institute, and that's terrific. So we are reaching out to a different group. But I also think that during this early stage of soaring, what do we want to address? What are some of the um, considerations and even Karen's statement about, I'm not quite sure how I fit into this. Is this community a Plexus research science complexity community? Is this a org design practitioners community? And I think that these very early stages are where we can bring in those questions. Hey guys, maybe what we should be doing is an informal, are there people out here who want to do some informal um, inclusion questionnaires or um, outreach in varying, varying sort of domains that we may not have experience in. So, um, you know, it's gonna prompt us to say, hey, how do we, look at it differently and any thoughts you may have no Naomi is great but before I turn it back to you Mike and or Karen I did want to say that I think the complexity community is um, very very distinct depending on where you enter it so from the scientific and now from the really data-driven um, modeling environment it does tend to have a greater level of diversity just by virtue of it being very science driven, but it is also very male. Uh, Plexus has always tried to be that bridge between practice and application and the organizations and people that complexity can serve. That's why we use the term complexity thinking. Um, and that has a higher degree of what I would say would be more org design practitioner consultant kind of folks. And I've sadly found that that does tend to be more white than not as we've found in a lot of the organizations that we've participated in and so uh, there's that sort of mix um, that we hope we can break into and maybe bring more people 
um, you know, in different worlds. The tech group that Mike mentioned, we do have some folks who are very interested and um, most of them are not from the US. They tend to be from out of the country and the timing of when we hold these tends to be a little bit of an issue. But I think there's some European and um, Asian communities that are very, have a much deeper level of diversity that um, are interested but are not participating here today. That's a great um, summary and, 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 and overview. Um, I appreciate that. And, and I think we tend to recreate uh, what we know. I don't even, um, I've seen it in a number of different communities. I have a very, very, very dear colleague who's been very involved in the diversity and inclusion effort for 30 years. And is also very involved in a different kind of community around the construction of social construction and meaning. And, and she's been dismayed for years at how she can't bridge these two. And I'm not sure what that structural issue, I, I don't know what that is. Um, but I think it shows up in a number of different different places. And that's sort of why I come to it saying, I think we have to be thoughtful about it and continue to inquire about it where we, um, uh, where we can. I, t I am an internal organizations person, and I, I also just want to highlight Barb's comment that, um, that time is so difficult for people to come by. I think part of it is related to money. I think part of it is just the speed with which work, you know, most workplaces are trying to move. Whether or not they're actually getting anywhere is another story. But the sheer volume of work that people are doing, which is part of why I think complexity is so important to think about, because they're trying to solve problems in old ways. And so taking the time to really think about how you're thinking is, um, it's, it's much more a to-do, it's still a much more to-do environment. And I find complexity, as I've introduced it to clients, is very, difficult for them to really wrap their head around the actual usefulness of it in thinking about how they grow and change and um, link to new efforts and activities. As much as they talk about innovation and the margins and all that kind of stuff, it's still comfortable margins and still margins that look similar to how we're currently thinking. And I think complexity is the edge of where many of us are thinking. I think that is a, um, a challenge we run, run into, Mike, because they just don't quite see it yet and don't have the, the time. It's a, it's a reinforcing loop. We don't have the time, so we don't see it, we don't see it, so we don't have the time. Um, I, 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 you're absolutely right. And I had originally thought, oh, I have, um, I'm going to, to go into sort of a, a background on intended and unintended consequences from the concept of <laughs> pattern distribution and emerging patterns. And I would have brought you all way down that rabbit hole of complexity and complexity thinking. Um, but one of the things that may be a bridge because it, as I was driving um, from a meeting this morning, there was a there was a you know an NPR um, conversation about the unintended consequences of one when they started to um, put in environmental controls regarding carbon con um, coal and started to move to different kinds of coal and then different kinds of energy and then there was this, this unintended consequence of a mercury buildup in certain states and. So the uh, the two scientists who were chatting made this you know this really interesting observation. We try to shift people's behavior, and we're telling them that this is the good thing to do. And we've put in um, you know restrictions. We've taken you know extreme economic and non-economic incentives or disincentives in order to switch behaviors, and we haven't thought about how do we continually switch those behaviors? So what are the next steps that we need to take? And um, I've, for you, know, you Karen, and, and, and Barb, and Mike, and some other people I know, Brooke is on the, on the call, who have done a lot of organizational work. It is, that's part of what I think is at the root of this question, um, Mike, is how do we set even if the conditions are only for a period of time. So for the first quarter of 2019, as we're um, 
working with other groups to set up what this what the commons project and what the beta testing environment will be how do we set that up to say that our three primary objectives one of which is to have it act like a self-organizing system and to start to intentionally break down the um, existence and consequences of of bias and you know i hate to use this term but sort of the sort of gender and um, ethnic you know superiority and control how do we break that down at the same time making sure that we have an opportunity for people to go into these kind of conversations which is why do they exist you know how can you have a conversation with yourself and go deeper into understanding what those behaviors are then surface it back up to say well here's what we're going to try to do and I think it, it is a complex problem because we're looking at multiple levels of behavior that have either long-term existence or short-term um, sort of emerging existence. And where do we focus our attention? Where do we bring in the capabilities and competencies that we have? Do we look at it from a structural organizational perspective? Do we look at it from a personal perspective? Do we look at it from your professional perspective? Um, I, I don't know. Those are, it, it becomes messy, but I do think that if we continually try to surface these kind of questions, we may put ourselves in a position where we're going to have the conversations that we don't even imagine would be helpful, but will ultimately give us next step options, if that makes sense. Uh, it, it does make sense. <clears throat> and I think I'd rather build a jet plane than fly it myself. <laughs> uh, um, Understood. <laughs> yes. It's, it's better, better I stick to a linear project <laughs> than a nonlinear project in some ways. So one of, one of the things that is interesting about any intellectual journey, and um, I have done a lot of reading in the social psychology of science and how science happens, and scientists um, think that they came to their conclusion from the start, and that's the conclusion that they always had in mind when they started their project, when that's almost never true. Um, their mind evolves along the way, as mine has. And the thing that I've recognized about this project is that there's, um, this encompasses so many different components um, that I'm just not even aware of. Um, so I've had to connect myself to different media outlets. I want to promote a, a company called Medium, which will send you a whole bunch of articles on things. Uh, of course, Bob is aware of that. <laughs> he, reads, he reads probably more than I do. Um, but so there's a lot of things that you know, I'm learning like today, I learned about um, stable coins, which I didn't realize that in this project, I had reinvented a stable coin, but in a different way. So this is something that already existed that I didn't know about. And it's not because I'm not intelligent and don't read and don't seek out things. Um, I think that um, with, with this particular project, because, it, because it's such a social innovation project, um, it, probably, it probably will have to be a multi-organizational one. It probably will not be just a plexus one. This is, this is my take on it. So it will involve um, a, an existing, say, Bitcoin-based company that's already involved in the environment. It will, in, it will involve a company that already is trying to do environmental education and has some uh, pictures that they would like to do, um, you know, like to put on the web for, to help people learn. It will, it will require um, organizations try to increase the diversity in this. So it's gonna have to be a multi-organizational uh, multi rather than a multi-individual kind of project. That's where I'm thinking. And this is even, so I want to, for people who are on, you're not sure what they're going to get from this call, this may even apply to some of the projects, some of the things you're doing, in that we tend to see ourselves as individuals solving things, but it may require a little bit more inter-organizational 
evolutions, which can be very, which can be very difficult, are always difficult. Um, but I think that's how this project was probably going to move forward. Uh, other comments? I would jump in one second just to say that um, what, I like what you said, Mike, and the, and the idea that what Denise said about framing, when you frame something, it's almost like you create a game. And once you have it framed, you have to have a policy. And once you have the policy, you need to coach everyone to understand what the game and how you play the game within using the policies. And as time emerges, you you incorporate one another into the framework. And so then the game and the policy may change a bit because you got a larger framework. And so that, um, and, and I'm not making that up. That kind of came from some of those ideas that you might find in Medium or other, but that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm curious if people have other projects. I know, like Michael, it did start out with his, his kind of uh, his project that's going on. Um, are some of the things, and this is open to anyone on the call, are some of the issues that we're confronting in this project, and again, this is held out as an example project for the larger issue of how do you drive social innovation in a social justice kind of way and also at the same time avoiding unintended consequences. So does this discussion apply to anyone on the call on projects that they're working on or they've heard of? Um, not getting any kind of response. If you do want to, because there's a number of people just on phone only, make sure that you unmute yourself if you do want to say something. So one of the one of the things that we hope to get out of this conversation also was the potential of people being. Um, uh, interested in the project itself and um, possibly becoming involved or suggesting organizations that might be involved. So that's definitely something we're looking for here. Um, this is not uh, a conversation I know is isolated to this particular group. I'm on a uh, committee that's going to have a social innovation conference in Washington DC in April. It's called the CAPS group. Uh, Denise is uh, put on, I believe Denise has put on um, information uh, about that CAPS uh, group. And we're going to be talking about social innovation and uh, from a complexity standpoint and how do we drive social, in social innovation. So, can I hear from anyone about what other social information, social innovation projects they're working on? There we go. Uh, this is Mike in Broward uh, County, Florida. And uh, I had mentioned uh, the need down here due to the MSD shooting. And in, in listening to your project here, it occurs to me that uh, I love the idea of go, going after organizations and let them pull in their, their individuals. Um, and tying in with Bitcoin would be the way to attract uh, everything minorities to, to, to you know, gender equity types of issues for example if you have uh children uh that are, are poor or adults or families that are poor or uh, uh, aren't utilizing social resources as they access those social resources you could provide uh through the the coin mechanism a way of uh incentivizing them uh, they could attend school board meetings say and become active in the community in that way and be compensated as far as the environment goes you know you could if they uh, use a bus uh, you can compensate them perhaps as far as uh, a carbon tax that you could th then sell to uh, larger corporations that they could you know uh, as far as a swapping of, of the, the carbon resources and uses so this, I think the economics is the way to reach out there so I think you've got a, an exciting model there that could be used in, in a number of different ways 
That's true. And I didn't want to make this just all about this particular project because I wanted to get ideas about social information uh, from anyone um, around the world, essentially. Um, but the, um, you're very right, very correct in that um, there are social relationships, social contracts that can be made that will decrease environmental impact. And this comes directly from a complexity science perspective, which is fairly well established that biological systems maintain their existence by, you, by gathering the, the, uh, the number of resources they need, you expending the minimal amount of energy. They don't gather more in, uh, resources than they need and they um, use as efficient of a process as, as possible. So, there, so even though someone might have, say, an individual solar panel, there are ways in which you can be connected to, um, say, you could use one of these digital coins to invest in a university project that would come up with a better solar panel. And then you might get the benefit of that investment, plus you'd have a better solar panel, which then would uh, further decrease your environmental impact. So there's, a, a, there's ways in which you could use this particular um, coin, this digital currency, to help run um, sort of a prediction market to kind of have a continual enhancement of the efficiency of use of services. You're, you're quite right on that. So, um, Naomi, you said that um, some projects in the UK were working well. Um, do, you, um, do you have a suggestion about that for the group? Do you feel, uh, would you want to talk about anything that you think is working well? Well, I sent, <coughs> thank you. I sent a link to the um, one in Manchester, which is an, a health service one, um, which is a collaboration of very various parts of our National Health Service and various public bodies and non-profits non and local communities. And that collaborative venture, is, it's just, had, as you'll see, it just had its um, life extended for a further three years. And I went to a talk that this, um, the team leading the project were um, explaining how they set it up. And it was very fascinating because they are sort of white middle class um, health worker types. But they literally went around social housing, knocking on people's doors and drumming up enthusiasm and interest as one of their first um, forays and setting up things which people in those social housing. Um, situations said that they needed in terms of healthcare, which wasn't necessarily what the originators of the idea were actually thinking of. And that, that seemed to me a very helpful way of, of starting out. They, they went and looked for who could be the customers of the ideas, rather than saying, they went and looked for ideas from potential customers, rather, rather than thinking, we have an idea, would you be interested in it? Yes, I, I mean, I think one of the things that's coming across is that if we want to include people, we have to listen to them. And the way that we show that we want to include people is by listening to them first, instead yes. of inviting them to step in. And so that's an example of listening first and exciting people by having them be heard. I think that's right. And the other one, I, I'm not familiar with it. I just read an article about it yesterday, but I sent you the link as well. The, the gleaning one, that, that's, that is another example of starting off with people who are food insecure and the, what, what is going to be helpful to them. And um, that, that seems to be working well on a very local level. I think, I think looking for people 
looking for the potential customer before you have the idea, if you see what I mean. Exploring the communities that you're interested in including and finding out what they need or want or that you could offer. A sort of reverse purchase mechanism. In, in a way, it's almost as if it would be really cool to give whatever these coins are to different target populations and invite them to spend them and see what they spend it on. Since we're not in a position to literally go knocking on doors internationally, that seems the way to do it is to just knock on people's door and say, this is not a con, this is a coin, these are the ways that you can spend it. We're, we're wondering what you would like. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm keep searching for a bubble that I think keeps floating around in different places and different sizes and I can't quite, I'm struggling to try and hone in on what, what, what the main points are here. <laughs> um, part of my takeaway, <laughs> Denise, you're laughing already. Part of my takeaway is I'm tempted to say that we're wrapped up in an approach, an approach that is based on educated white people as opposed to an approach based on, I'll take off on what I think it was, Naomi, I think, was talking about. What they call a design thinking approach or a social activist approach, an approach based on help, helping, helping others for what they need. And there's been a significant shift. You know, I stand back at 50,000 feet. I think about just the concepts for analogies of design thinking, um, of social activism. They're based upon not selling an idea, but helping people achieve what they need or what they want. Um, I think that you know, like a, the, a Bitcoin approach, okay, fine, but what percentage of the people or population have anything to do with or even understand that? Um, so I'm, I keep searching for what it is we're trying to do in our definition of success on this. Because if, you're, if we put ourselves in a place of, a so, of being a social activist or look back in history of how different social activist movements occurred or became successful or died, um, it was much more experimental. Um, whatever works at the moment. And keep trying and trying and dealing with continuous failure and just keep trying to make things happen in one big continuous experiment. So um, I, don't, I don't want to ramble on anymore. <laughs> but I, 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 just, I guess I'm sharing my, my, my perception of the bubbles floating around here that I'm trying to grasp a hold of and can't quite grasp. So, and I'm wondering how much of our approach to thinking about this in the conversation is causing those bubbles to be bubbles as opposed to something more concrete. It's, in, it's interesting to stand back and look at it and say, here's an approach we could take for a project versus jump in and just start doing. So you, you caught us at a particular point in our evolutionary thinking. So we were actually, before this, we were at the, let's just jump in and create something and see how it works. Uh, but then we realized that we may, um, we may by creating something, um, not be aware of what we were, what the consequences were going to be and be able to adjust rapidly enough. So we took a step back to before we created something, and this definitely is, is on our, our mind to create a prototype and do kind of a fast evolution of it. But in our initial contacts, we had a contact with a um, blockchain group, um, um, blocking on the name now, and no, no pun intended, um, but uh, that um, they wanted us to come up with a project very quickly and do fast tracking and rapid evolution, but we realized that it might get out of our, yeah, Dow stack, thank you. It, may, it might get out of, uh, it may, we didn't want it to create problems. Now you can't anticipate all problems, we knew that, but we didn't want to um, just have this boom, big pro social media project out there create problems that we could have anticipated, 
but you're right. We do need to move to that step of having something that we do take out there and we try it and we learn and we listen. So this happens to be where you caught us in our evolutionary thinking chain, so to speak. Maybe what gets, what, what I'm tracking in my mind, I don't know if this gets lost, but I'm thinking, so I'm aware of a number of healthcare related projects where the goal has been to increase, to, to impact a community's health. Um, and you then, and then the question becomes, uh, then I think you can go into the community. This is often, I know a number of projects as well, at, where we go into the community and we say, and we go to the community where the community comes together instead of asking the community to come to us, the providers, which changes the model of delivery. I think here, what we're, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what we're talking about here is how to help raise awareness of my own footprint and to develop a greater consciousness of the ecological consequences for how I and we live through an online something I might play with that actually gives me information or my organization information and then some kind of a coin that I could earn and trade for things. But what we're talking about is something in the, in the umbrella of sustainability, right? And ecological. So I think we have to think like about, so if we want to include people who are different from ourselves, what are the questions we want to ask? It's not just, what do you want? It's, what does this mean to you? Or, um, I, I'm not quite so. So I'm I'm playing with that parallel in my mind because it's it's we want to raise a community's awareness or raise people's awareness. So I, I think that's the thing that we're playing with here that I don't know if has if it's been played with before. But it's a it's a slightly different question because we do have an agenda that that's a valuable thing to do. If um, if that. Is what I don't, and I don't know if that helps for the person who said I, the bubbles are floating around. Yeah, so if that if, if, if that is what we're trying to do or what you know, the concept is fine. I'm unclear why the diversity aspect of it comes in. Okay, so I think I can address that. I think the diversity aspect that comes in, in that when um, well, some of it came in like through this. I popped on a call related to something and kind of started talking about my interests because that's what the call, I don't remember what it was about. Um, I think Mike's question is, if we're creating a platform that is going to help raise people's awareness or community's awareness, however chooses to play, how do we, we are in fact creating a community or some sort of a diffuse organizational structure and how do we create that structure so that it, we avoid some of what we know are unintended biases that crop up even in an online platform? I, That's where this conversation got comes it. into play. So my take on this is you're, we're trying to look way too far into the crystal ball, trying to set up a solution that would be a long time coming to create as opposed to if the first step is to try to find some, let's say, online tool to raise or some mechanism to raise awareness, then that is the first step. Just start doing that. And from the way that works and what comes out of that, the other pieces of that longer term roadmap for that ultimate vision will start to shape and form and, and take some divergences and then offer some opportunities. I think that that is um, true. Um, and, and that's, I think, some of what I was trying to say. I don't know that we know enough to predict. I mean, we, we can talk about what are the lessons learned in other social media examples. And that's probably a good thing to research and talk about and build into the beginning, if that's a value that we have. But I think the other piece of it is that it, it is very difficult, but at least we have to be clear on our intent that we are going to inquire within ourselves about what is creating 
barriers, institutional barriers that we may not have anticipated. And let me tell you, that work is not easy. So is I wanted to bring in a concrete example of uh, Facebook. There's a wonderful book I'm going to recommend called Like War. I don't remember who wrote it, but it's called Like War. And um, uh, Facebook got into problems because their basic mechanism of asking questions, to kind of connect to what Karen said, and how they gener generate information, uh, came down to a binary choice, like, not like. And because the question was uh, framed as just a binary choice, there was nothing, there was no nuance, and essentially um, forced people into that binary choice. Do you like or not like? Whatever the particular topic is. And that organization recognized down the road, and I agree with you entirely, that you can't anticipate all these problems. I never, never believe you ever could. But, the, um, but even when they started to recognize that, they didn't have a mechanism in place to uh, address it because it was their basic revenue stream. And essentially, they, they painted themselves into a corner and they couldn't unpaint what they'd already created. So I, I do like um, the idea of Karen said about creating that awareness as we go along, because we, be, we will be creating a prototype, we will be trying it and getting feedback and listening to people. But unless we have that awareness of, okay, well, this is the feedback we got, but what are the potential consequences? If we're not uh, even ask people what they think the potential consequences would be, intended and unintended, um, you know, I, I did not. I did not want to create a, a social problem <laughs> while trying to create a social good. I guess I, that yeah, that makes sense. I guess what I'm saying is, chunk it up, break yeah. it out in different pieces, and just focus in the short term, short cycle learning experimentation. And when you string those together path becomes clearer, the direction, some of those questions become clearer. That's exactly, a, that's a great segue. Thank you. I owe you a dollar. Because Five. It would be a great segue because we have a series of three other uh, pop-ups because we've chunked this into four different chunks. The next one, uh, Denise, I believe uh, Barb is going to be um, uh, leading on the graphic, uh, graphical interface of this project. Bob, raise your hand, Bob. Um, Bob and I will be working on the blockchain and the, um, and the coin aspect. And then finally at the end, um, our colleague from England, Chris Lawler, will be working on, uh, on value and um, distribution of value. So we have that going on. Jerry, did you have a comment? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, look, I came in late. And um, I, I followed uh, your work for a while, and you know, I, my experience goes back to it seems like a hundred years ago when I was studying anthropology, and the, one of the first case studies that about social systems was. Very well intentioned effort to take some smart people who knew farming and had a great new form of corn that was more productive and cheaper to raise and take it down to Mexico and sell it to the farmers. And the farmers went broke when they adopted it. Why? No one thought that the main function of a taco was to hold a bunch of food. Was a, it was, you used it to make a bread for sandwich. This new corn couldn't work as a sandwich. And the lesson I got from that is you can never know enough. And when you do business, or when you used to do massive business plans to raise millions of dollars, everybody knew that the day you started the company, you threw out the business plan because you'd learn the reality. And I, I, I just, you know, what I'm trying to do, I won't go into that now, but it, I know that what I'm going to do is going to raise horrible objections 
and, and knife fights, and I'll regret having done it. But I feel I have to try. Fortunately, you can't bring a knife to a internet fight. Well, maybe that's the, the, the important lesson. <laughs> when, when I go up, when I go up onto Beacon Hill, I hope they keep their knives in a drawer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So unintended consequences. Our 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 goal is not to to avoid all unintended consequences. Our goal is to create a system that we identify as many as possible, and then maybe uh, create that awareness that allows them to be uh, identified as we go along. I, I, as far as I know, I have other comments, but I think that's the best we can do. I also, um, I was going to say, I'd love to have you summarize it too, but I'm, I'm walking away from the conversation one. Thanks everyone for your comments. Um, and please put your email in there. I have them, but if you'd like us to reach out to you specifically, just put it in the chat. Uh, but I think there are four or five um, threads that occurred. And I think, you know, the concept of we're all bringing our own professional or um, you know personal perspectives um, to to what this conversation is about, and I learned several things. One, I'm sitting here constantly holding this whole complexity thought. I'm thinking we need to share with people what we need to do around infusing concepts of complexity, so that when we have these conversations, we recognize that they are supposed to be generative, and where we start may be nowhere where 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 we end. But at the same time, what Naomi said and what Brooks said um, were both, you know, very clear to me that you have to put your stake in the ground at some point. And I appreciate, Mike, that we had stakes in the ground and we were trying to open this up so that we were um, making sure that the next iteration might have um, more voices in it. And so uh, before I turn this back to Mike, this is my call for we have more voices here today and I hope that you'll um, you know, reach out individually, um, get involved, but then even more importantly say, here's something that you might want to think about and look at and maybe you know the folks at the plexus network can become you know at least part of those conversations because i think if we don't start actually doing it and showing how we are approaching things differently it's going to be different to explain why we're thinking that this process or the concepts of having it be more self-organized and not designed and then implemented and tested um, is worthwhile so Back to you, Mike, and thank you, everybody. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Um, so in, in my summary, um, I, um, I do think that um, we can take all the input here as wisdom and insight and incorporate in what we're doing. Um, it will be, um, we, we will be gathering other information and we have a connection to some, you know, some groups who have an interest in working with us. We even um, had our project, the initial concept of the project, um, it's going to be published in an academic paper. And if my presentation is accepted for the April conference, that will go into another academic paper. But um, I think that after we have our conversations on these four chunks here in the month of January, then the next step would be to have that stake in the ground and um, engage with the organization that can help us put uh, sauce on that steak, to use a non-vegetarian analogy. But I also would like to offer anyone on the call who has projects who wants uh, different input. Um, we have Catalyst and the Plexus Institute who can provide some of those kinds of skills uh, because you can see that um, we're, we're, we're aware of the problems, um, and that's the first step to solving the problem is, is the awareness. So we can help if you have a particular project you're working on, you're looking to increase awareness about the difficulties of your particular project, uh, the Catalyst of Plexus Institute could help you with that. Any other comments, Karen?
Do you have any final comments and thoughts? I was, having, uh, I was having trouble unmuting. Uh, um, well, this has been um, uh, wide ranging and um, interesting. And I, I copied some of the links from the chat. Um, I wish we had more time to hear from everybody and know who everybody is. Um, but I, I appreciate your, your, your inclusion of me, Mike, and your um, immediate uh, magnetism to the to the uh, to the challenge of inclusion, and I think it will serve us well as part of the compass of building what you're building. Um, and so I support what Brooke is saying. I think we need to get on and do it, and know that it won't be done right. That there will be challenges to inclusion if you look for them, and yes. that's that's part of the learning. It's very real time in organizations today. It is absolutely like I said today. I learned about a new domain of the blockchain bitcoin universe that i was not aware of before and right. um apparently i reinvented calculus and i didn't even know it <laughs> so thanks for thanks for including me i appreciate it thank you denise do we want to uh, wrap this up and um let's thank people and um uh, we'll give uh, five seconds for people to unmute and make any other comments, but otherwise we'll close this recording. And I do thank everyone for, to, uh, for participating. This is um, um, relative to a lot of uh, web meetings that I've seen. This has actually had a, a lot of participation, um, a good number of people. So thanks everyone for attending. And we're gonna go ahead and stop the recording now. I'll hang on for a little bit and wants to ask me uh, 